Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's live streaming EKU Chautauqua presentation, sponsored by Eastern Kentucky University's nationally prominent honors program and housed in the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences. It's nice to see you all here. I know that you had to uh, connect through a new link. Thank you for doing that and figuring it out. I see lots of um, familiar names in the chat already, uh, Matt and Jill and Nick and uh, others and the Department of Psychology itself. So uh, welcome everybody. My name is Eric Liddell. I am the Chautauqua Lecture Series Coordinator and I am delighted to be joined tonight by my uh, colleague and friend, Dr. Sarah and Sarah of Psychology, who's here to present a talk on using data to uncover the bilingual mind. Hello, Sarah. Hi. And and I know her dog Luna is in the background there somewhere. She may, <laughs> She's just leaving uh, right here. <laughs> she may, may make an appearance at some point tonight. But uh, before we turn to tonight's presentation, let me uh, take a moment to recognize uh, the passing last night of Dr. Bruce McLaren. As many of you out there know from the EKU community, Bruce was a retired EKU professor of natural sciences and a longtime teacher in our honors program. And he was also very well known, perhaps best known, as the founding director of this Chautauqua lecture series, which he began around 2000 and he led for 10 years until his retirement. Bruce, as everybody who knows him will agree, was an original and a visionary and emotive spirit behind EKU Chautauqua, which I am now very honored to coordinate. And since his retirement, when he handed over the reins of Chautauqua to my predecessor, Ming Wen, we have celebrated Bruce, Bruce's life, work, and legacy with a distinguished lecture in his name each year. And here, let me offer condolences to Bruce's wife, Marcia, and the rest of his family, and indeed the whole EKU community. And uh, you can find many testimonials from uh, friends and colleagues and former students alike on Facebook and so on, if you wanna spend some time looking at those. And now for just a brief moment of silence before we get started tonight, let me try to share my screen just to uh, show people a couple images of uh, Bruce. Uh, you see him there. I think, uh, Sarah, not if you can see the images on screen. Okay, you see Bruce there with uh, our colleague and friend Ming Nguyen uh, on the right-hand side, and there he is on the left-hand side with me and two of our Bruce McLaren speakers, Amy and Dave Freeman, who happened to be originally from Minnesota like Bruce himself. Okay, thank you, everyone. And I've stopped sharing now. So hopefully you can see uh, me and Sarah again on screen. And uh, back to tonight's presentation. In just a moment, I will hand the screen over to Sarah and then I will return at the conclusion of her remarks for some Q&A and discussion. And viewers out there are encouraged to submit comments and questions right here in the YouTube chat. And I know that Sarah also has uh, some sort of uh, viewer and our audience feedback uh, stuff to incorporate as well. And we'll take all of that up in the Q&A and discussion portion at the end of her presentation. Uh, you can also uh, submit to our Twitter account, if you wish, at EKU Chautauqua. And of course, you can always find full details about EKU Chautauquas on our website, on Facebook, and on Twitter. And so now, without further ado, uh, Dr. Sarah and Sarah is professor, a professor in the EKU Department of Psychology and a principal investigator in the EKU Multilingual Laboratory. She teaches courses in research methods and cognitive psychology. Her research interests include cognition, bilingualism, foreign accents, second language acquisition, and language development across the lifespan. And her work has been presented in national and international venues. She completed both bachelor's and master's degrees at the Universidad de Salamanca, before earning another master's degree and the PhD at Cleveland State University, where she wrote her dissertation on bilingualism across the adult lifespan, and where she spent a year as a postdoc prior to arriving at EKU, uh, where we are very uh, pleased to have her as a colleague in 2017. So uh, thank you for being here, Sarah. 
And it's a pleasure to welcome you to EKU Chautauqua. Take it away and I'll see you back in a bit. Well, thank you, Eric, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I really appreciate that. Uh, so before we jump into today's data and the story of this talk that I'm going to tell you about, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, how I got to research these topics, how I got interested into these, right? So first of all, uh, as Eric mentioned, I'm originally from Spain. So I did my undergraduate in psychology at the Universidad de Salamanca, which is one of the oldest universities in Europe. So as part of my undergraduate experience, I spent a year in Ireland at the University College Cork, and this was a very profoundly changing experience for me. So, well, first of all, I fell in love with my now husband, Dave, and falling in love can definitely change who you are. But I also... Uh, found that language speaking English uh, was this really, it, it really changed how I view myself and, um, you know, who I was. Because when I originally uh, studied English in Spain, right, I've, I've had courses and stuff, but I hadn't actually lived in a place where I had to use it. So one of my first memories of speaking English was my very first lecture at University College Cork, and everyone had to introduce themselves. So I was very excited about this, and I also was a little bit nervous, right? In Spain, this would have been a no-brainer. I would have stand up, introduce myself, be done. Now, for this Class. It was my first time in an English class and I had to introduce myself in English. So I had this, you know, sentence and introduction very ready and prepared. I had been rehearsing it, right? Uh, so I'm originally from Santander, which is uh, a, nor a, a city in the north coast of Spain. So I wanted to talk about how my city is this beautiful coastal city and there is cliffs and stuff, right? So I was uh, at this class. I stand up and very confidently I say, my name is Sarah. I'm originally from Santander. Santander has some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. And then everyone started laughing and I had no idea what was going on because if you know anything about Spanish, in Spanish you only have like five vowels, right? Like a, A, E, O, U. And these are like short vowels. So we don't have like the E long vowels that English speakers have. So I had no idea that it would mistake I've made. I was like, I Googled this. I, I knew this was the right sentence, but it was not, right? And probably this story is one of the reasons why I then got interested in foreign accents and these other research topics. So another thing that I got really interested when studying abroad um, was reading because my experience when I was in Ireland, I've always been uh, a voracious reader, right? Like I will finish each of the Harry Potter books in like a weekend. And I, I read a lot. I always read a lot. I always did really well in language. And then I arrived to Ireland and I have this introductory book, Introduction to Psychology, which I had a lot of psychology by this point. I knew what it was going to say, but these chapters in this book felt like they, they, they were felt forever. These were chapters that maybe in Spain, in Spanish, it would have taken me like 30 minutes to read. And in Ireland, I was there like page after page, every sentence I had to Google like five words and I didn't know what the whole, put it all together. It was so much effort to really be able to read in English for me, right? So when I went back uh, to Spain after uh, this experience in Ireland, I actually became part of the um, reading and writing laboratory in in, in the University of Salamanca because I was really fascinated about, you know, how children with dyslexia and how people who have reading difficulties, how can they read, right? So for all those uh, second language uh, learners out there, if you are struggling uh, reading in English, it gets easier. You just have to kind of stay with it and keep trying and, and it gets easier, I promise you. But all of these um, all of these issues kind of like really changed me, right? So uh, as Eric said, I have a couple of questions for the audience that we will check out at the end of the, during the Q&A session. So if uh, my first question for the audience is, have you studied or, or lived abroad? And if so, where, right? Like, have you had any of these experiences in which you are immersed in a foreign country or a foreign language? And, you know, then you have social food pause because of, of this situation. Okay, so all of these uh, experiences, in addition to, to really change who I was, made me very interested in what is called the psychology of language. So, 
in, um, you know, there are many fields that study language. So you have like linguistics, literature, and there are, and, and you know, um, a lot of, uh, you know, you can study Spanish and you can study French and different languages. But that is not exactly what I'm talking about. When we talk about the psychology of language, we don't necessarily focus on the language itself. We focus on how people use it. So what I'm very interested in is in how people use language, people learn language, how people people see themselves because the language they are using, right? So the, the big question here is, can language influence you, right? That's kind of like my big, big picture question. So let me start my presentation now that I've told you a little bit about the background. So first of all, uh, I'm uh, in Arikiyu. I ran the multilingual laboratory in the Keith building. Uh, so I want to thank my students and all of my collaborators for all, all of this work couldn't happen without undergraduate and graduate students working really hard to collect this data and, and you know, understand um, what is going on. So the big question that I'm trying to uh, answer here is, does language influence you? And this is what the psychology of language is about, right? So it's not so much about the structure of language, of, of how language works. It's more about how people use it and how language influences us, who we are and, and how we communicate, right? So more specifically, I'm going to talk about three things because I'm going to present uh, three different studies with Atan. These are three different publications. So. Each of these studies have been published while I've been here at EKU, and they answer these questions. Can language change how you respond? Can language change how you think? And can language change how you feel? So throughout this presentation, I'm going to be talking to you about this, about the effect of language on how you respond to things, how you think about things, and how you feel things. Okay? And each of these correspond to a different publication. So first, this is about data, right? Like the series, the Chautauqua series for this uh, year are, are about how we collect and use data. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a background. Historically, in psychology, people have measured head sizes. And let me tell you, head size does not correlate with intelligence. They try really hard to see if bigger heads uh, will be also a smarter or more intelligent people. Zero correlation, there was nothing there. So they soon realized that head size was not you know, psychologists soon realized that head size was not bringing them anywhere. So then in the in the 50s and so on, when the cognitive revolution happened, people start using computers. Now we're talking because with computers, you're really able to measure very quick responses, right? So you, um, you know, ling language researchers, for example, will uh, present words over headphones or will present words or sentences on the screen and people will have to respond to different tasks, right? Like, um, does this work? Uh, does this sentence make sense? Or, or, or different tasks in which they were responded uh, by pressing a button. So this was kind of quick, right? Like you would present it with some information and they will have to respond. And of course, uh, linguists, uh, the psychologists that focus on language will use like words and sentences, but other researchers may use uh, images and all sorts of uh, things that you can present to these participants on the screen, and then people will respond. And the measure here is usually Accuracy, like right or wrong, did you get the correct response right? And then also speed, right? We call these reaction times, which is basically how fast you react, how fast you were able to respond. Now, this is great, and a lot of cognitive psychology has been based on these, on, on uh, participants answering and pressing the bottom. But in the last decade or so, we actually have uh, had a new tool that came, uh, you know, into place that has really influenced how a lot of cognitive psychologists think about uh, cognition. And this is mouse tracking. So mouse tracking, instead of just recording like that final button press at the end, so you you know you 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 hear a word, you process it, and then you just respond. With mouse tracking, you can actually see how people are thinking. You can kind of see where they are moving. Are they moving up or down, or or how are they making the decision? Right. A lot of what we study is also like decision making. And with the mouse, you are able to see how people are responding how people are, um, you know, uh, understanding these words or processing these sentences or depending on the task you're doing different things. So let me show you how mass tracking works. Uh, this is an example of what it will be called like a baseline. So the, the response options are 
right or left corner of the screen, right? And what happened here is when you click start there at the bottom, the word here appears either on the top right or on the top left corner of the screen, depending if it's randomized, right? So this is just a baseline. Uh, here, we're not presenting words or images or anything just yet. This is just kind of to get people started, to get people moving the mouse up and down, just to teach people the task. So let me show you, if you click start, then you need to respond by clicking on the correct response. And then when you click here, the here will disappear. You have to go back to click start again for a new trial, right? So when you do this, you are just kind of going uh, back and forth here. And you know you have many trials in each task. So the second part I want to show you is how does this mouse movement translate into graphs? Because for the reminder of this presentation, I'm going to be showing you this type of graph. So uh, first, let me show you uh, down there, if you see, you're going to see time on the horizontal. And then x coordinate is just the, the position of the mouse. So when you click a star here, you can see how at the same time as like the arrow goes to the here, that's kind of how it will be drawn on this graph. So in here, you can see how higher, so if the line goes up faster, basically, you're doing better, right? Those people who go really quickly and really efficiently towards the correct response, their lines go up really fast in these. This is what is called a line graph, and line graphs are usually, usually have time in the horizontal, and then the, in this case, the mouse position and the vertical. So the faster you move towards the correct response, the, that line is going up quicker. Now, let me bring to your attention Time there says a thousand milliseconds, right? Like the MS there is milliseconds. So uh, for those who are not familiar with the metrics, then like a thousand milliseconds is one second. So this is really quick. This is the field of cognitive psychology lives in milliseconds, like 200 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds. That's what we care about. These are really quick uh, cognitive processes happening in your brain. So basically when you hear a word or a sentence, you process that in like a second or less, right? Like you, you process that information really quickly. Um, so actually a word in less than a second, much less than a second. So here with these mouse movements, we're kind of looking at those early, how are people choosing, finding, um, uh, processing or, or understanding a word? Like we, we're looking at very quick and very early processes. So we live when we, when I talk about time in all of these uh, mouse tracking studies, I'm always talking in like milliseconds. Um, it's always like one second total. Okay. So I hope you uh, can understand this graph, this, uh, you know, the mouse position over time, because I'm going to use similar graphs for the reminder on the pre of the presentation when I talk about mouse tracking and results from mouse tracking. Okay, so I hope that was a good introduction. Everyone understands what I'm coming from and how I'm doing this, right? And now we're gonna uh, start with one of the three studies. So we have, um, I'm gonna present three studies and each of these studies are gonna focus on a different topic. So my first study uh, is gonna talk, uh, is gonna focus on how can language change how you respond? Okay, so, before I jump into showing you the results for this study, I want to give you a little bit of background uh, in this study. Uh, and this brings my back to where I was in Ireland again. So in Ireland, um, in my apartment, we were a German, a French, and me, a Spaniard, right? So we were kind of like the beginning of a European joke. And the three of us went out there and studied hard for our classes. And we spent like all day working really hard to understand English, right? Because neither of us were like that good at English when we started. So we arrived home in the afternoon, right? And we will just, I, I remember vividly, we will just lock ourselves in our bedrooms just to, I, I would just watch Spanish shows. It was kind of like, I cannot think of a single English word anymore. I'm just exhausted. And we will get, I we call this like language headaches. When you spend all day working really hard to understand the language you're trying to use, thinking really carefully about what to say and how to say it, you, you almost get the, like these language headaches of all the effort and, and 
you know, all the uh, exhaustion of trying to speak a second language. So my second question for the chat, if, if you guys are following along, is um, have you learned a second language? And if so, has it been exhausting or was your experience uh, better than our experience? Because for us, those first few months where we were just immersed in English and you had to like swim or sink type of situation was definitely tough. Okay. Okay, so why am I talking about language headaches? What I'm trying to convey here is when we had these language headaches, our brain was working hard. Like we were focusing, we were paying attention. We were like, oh no, that's in Spanish. Forget that word, focusing on the new word. We were doing a lot of mental work, a lot of mental effort to try to understand a language, right? And the question is, learning a new language, using, uh, making all this effort of managing your two languages, is that changing you in any meaningful way? way, right? That's the question I'm trying to answer in this, uh, in this first study. So can language change how you respond? And if um, you look at this paper, so this is actually my doctoral dissertation. I was uh, very excited that uh, this got published in Aging Neuropsychology and Cognition. And in my doctoral dissertation, I look at bilingualism and also age. So I did this over the course of the lifespan. I, I had bilinguals and monolinguals uh, from 18 all the way to like 88 years old, right? But the interesting thing that we did is that bilingualism, instead of calling it bilinguals versus monolinguals, which had been done before, like either you're bilingual or not, we actually look at bilingualism on a continuum. So basically, do you use both languages like 50-50% of the time? Or do you use one of your languages like 80% of the time and the other just 20% of the time? This will be less, less active bilinguals, right? So basically, are you getting those language headaches if you're learning the two languages and using the two languages a lot? Or are you more like you know one language very well and you don't know that language that well, the other language, or you don't use it as much? So the idea here is, are people who are using both of their, of their languages more often and switching back and forth more, um, uh, you know, during, throughout their days or their weeks, are those people putting more effort? Are those people different than those who may be bilinguals but don't use one of their languages at all, as often, or those who are completely monolinguals, right? So... To study this, we use what is called the Stroop task. The Stroop task is a classic cognitive psychology task. It was published by Stroop in 1935. And the Stroop task is basically telling people, do not read the word, do not read the word, ignore reading the word, just focus on the color that the word is written in, okay? So in this case, the color can be blue, green, red, or yellow. And, you know, we tried to do four, all four colors on four colors of the screen, and then the data didn't come up great. So we just, you know, if it's blue or green, click there. If it's red or yellow, click over there, right? But the idea is focus on the color. Do not read the word, just read the color. So when you click start, you the color is blue. Do not read the word. Doesn't matter that the word is blue as well. Just move and click blue. Now. What happened with the word that is written kind of tricks you. So if you click start, people go to blue. Hey, wait, wait, it was yellow because I had to focus on the color. This is the effect. This is called the Stroop effect. And almost everyone gets distracted. Everyone automatically reads the word and instead of focusing on the yellow, right? Instead of clicking yellow, that is the color. So when you look at this task, uh, if you think about it, people who are really good at ignoring distracted information and focusing on the information that is um, that, that you need to focus on, in this case, the color, uh, those people perform better in this task. So the question for us was, are bilinguals who are more used to doing this switching back and forth between the language, we are constantly juggling these, um, more efficient are ignoring the reading and focusing on the color than monolinguals. And also with bilinguals, are those who switch between their two languages like 50-50 a lot of, more often, are those people more efficient at this work, at this task that the, the less, uh, the, the less um, active bilinguals that maybe use one of their languages like 20% of the time, right? And remember, so this, the graph I'm going to show you here, this is a mouse tracking line graph. So basically, if the line goes up faster, that means people are responding more efficiently to this task. They are not getting as distracted by the, the word they are reading and just focusing on the color. And then over time, Again, this is just one second, so this happens really quickly. 
Okay, so if you look at there at the legend, bilingual high, these are the 50-50 people, the, the people who use both of their languages very often, bilingual high are the best performance. That line, that white line go up all the way very efficiently. Bilingual low, these are like the 80-20 bilinguals, like one of their languages is dominant, they kind of use the other language, but not as often. They are better than the monolinguals, but they are kind of in the middle versus the monolinguals, they are less efficient at this task in which you have to focus on one thing and ignore the other things. So basically, using a second language, how much you use a second language changes how efficiently you respond to tasks in, these are attentional tasks, to tasks in which you have to like focus on one thing and ignore a different thing, okay? So that's the take home message of the first study. So can language change how you respond? Yes, if you speak a second language, you can respond more efficiently to some of these tasks in which you can have to switch back and forth. Okay, second study, can language change how you think? So this is a very uh, interesting study that um, I, I really enjoy uh, studying these uh, when we got started. So let me tell you a little bit of the story behind um, how did we came about with this study. So basically I was at Cleveland State University. I was at the Language Research Laboratory, which is my mentor, uh, Dr. Connor McLennan uh, Laboratory. And we were, um, in a lab meeting and someone was presenting because one of the lines of research they were studying was the connection between music and language. So they were um, in language, they have done some studies in which they compare feminine and masculine voices. So it was like how boys in a spoken uh, words, how boys influences people. And they were trying to make a, a, a parallel study with music. So they were looking at the literature, uh, the musical literature to find masculine and feminine instruments, right? So if you think about a flute, a flute will be a very feminine instrument because it's like very high pitch, very petite, um, uh, females played, right? Now, when my uh, when my of one when my one of my collaborators was presenting this to the group, her example for the masculine instrument, the prototypical masculine instrument, was tuba, and she was saying that for all English speakers, tuba was a very masculine instrument. And when I heard that, I was like, "Wait, what? Tuba? Because for me, in Spanish, tuba is la." to ba with an a, which for those of you who don't know Spanish grammar, feminine grammar, like if you, if you end in an a, or there's some exceptions, but in general, the rule is that if it ends in an a, that is a feminine grammar, right? So in my head, tuba was clearly feminine. And they were telling me that for English speakers, tuba was completely masculine. So those of you who are in a chat, right? Which language is your primary language? And if you think of a tuba, is it masculine? Is it feminine? What is it for you, right? So this was the discussion. We started talking about this and it's like, no, tuba, tuba is clearly feminine. And then my English collaborator was like, no, you're out of your mind. This tuba is clearly masculine. How can it be feminine? It's so big. And so, you know, males uh, play usually and it's all this reason for it, right? So because uh, when you have researchers disagreeing, what they do is go and collect some data on this. We went ahead and collect some data for this experiment. So let me show you the data we collected. So this data uh, was published uh, in the um, in the art, in the journal Mind and Language. And for this study, I want to clarify: these were not bilinguals. For this study, we collected a group of monolinguals English speakers from Cleveland and a group of monolinguals Spanish speakers from Santander, Spain. So this, you know, I embark my mom and all these people to recruit Spaniards who were doing nothing in the summer and were so nice as to answer my study about musical instruments. So in this case, we are comparing two groups of people, people whose native language is Spanish and just speak Spanish, people whose native language is English, just speak English. And the question is, will they perceive these musical instruments in the same way, if, if the perception of gender of musical instruments is just based on the characteristics of the instruments, like how big the instrument is and the pitch and things like that, language should make a difference. Or for the Spaniards, the grammatical gender that is not, that's not a thing in English, but it's a thing in Spanish, will that switch people's minds? Will that make them think, uh, okay, wait, that, that may not be, um, uh, like tuba may not be a masculine instrument, right? What happened? 
Okay, so let me show you what happened. So first, the method. This is, a, again, a mass tracking study. Now, here, notice there is not a right or wrong answer. Here, uh, the top response is just one continuum response. So it goes all the way from male to female along the continuum. And the question is, where do they click along the continuum? So when I show you the graphs, in this case, it's not higher, better. In this case, is Higher is more female and lower is going to be more male, but there's no like right or wrong in this study. Now, when you have English speakers, if you show them to, but we know they click male. That was clear. That was from previous research and this has been established. There is, you know, gender associated to certain musical instruments and that was clear. The question is, what happened to the Spanish speakers? So notice that now it's masculino, uh, femenino. We changed the language of the study because this was monolingual Spanish speakers. And now the question is, what are they doing? Are they being influenced by their language? Are they considering to be feminine or not or what? Right? That's the question. Okay. So let me show you, the question is, does grammatical gender influence the Spaniards, right? So here you can see, um, the, these are the lines for the English speakers. So the red line are the female instruments and the blue line. So the red line there will be flute, right? Flute is a feminine instrument. And then the blue dotted line are the masculine instruments. And as I said before, um, here there's no right or wrong. So if the line goes up, that is more feminine. If the lines go down, that is more masculine. So in the top graph is when the musical instruments in Spanish have uh, Spanish grammar, but that doesn't affect the English speakers. And then at the bottom is um, the opposite. When in Spanish, they have masculine grammar. But again, for the English speakers, those feminine instruments are feminine, those masculine instruments are, are masculine, no difference. Now, the question is, what happened to the Spanish speakers? So if you think about a tuba, and it's a very masculine instrument, but you have this, um, you know, Spanish grammar is a feminine grammar, what happened? Or the other case could be the piccolo, right? So the piccolo is a very high pitch uh, instrument, but in Spanish is el piccolo, which is the, the um, you know, male grammatical gender for Spanish. So what happened to those? Well, as you can see there, the tuba and the piccolo were actually rated neutral. So Spaniards didn't go as far as to just ignore characteristics of the instruments and just focus on the grammar, kind of how I would have predicted, nor did they ignore the grammar and just go with the characteristics like my lab mates would have predicted. They actually put it somewhere in the middle. So Spaniards took the information from the instrument, like the size and the, uh, you know, all those things, the pitch, and then they took the information from the grammar and they kind of combine it all and we're like, okay, tuba, kind of a neutral instrument. Piccolo, kind of a neutral instrument, right? Where that tuba was clearly masculine for English speakers and that piccolo was clearly feminine for English speakers, but for Spanish was not. So this is also, um, you know, how our brain is like the great aggregator, right? Because our, our brain gets all this information from the the, the size of the instrument, the pitch of the instrument, the grammar of the language, and puts it all together. But coming back to our original question, if you think about does language influence how you think, it does, because the language you speak made this Spaniards consider it to be a more of a neutral instrument as opposed to a masculine instrument, right? So in this case, the grammar changed how people saw these musical instruments. Okay. So that was a study too. Can language change how you think? And the answer I hope I've convinced you is yes. And then now we are ready for the very last study. Can language change how you feel? Okay, so as always, let me start by telling you a little bit of the story behind this study. Uh, this is kind of like a topic that I've been fascinated by, um, by for a long time. So uh, I told you before, I fall in love with my now husband, Dave, when I was in Ireland. So at the end of our trip, we were um, in this beautiful uh, cliff back in Santander. He came with me uh, for vacation. That one with the wonderful beaches all, all along the way, right? And at some point, he uh, turned to me and he looked at me in the eye and he told me, I love you. And without missing a bit, I kind of asked, can you say that in Spanish? Can you tell me 
te quiero, which is the same thing in Spanish. Because for me, the words, I love you, didn't quite do the trick. Like, the, I didn't feel them. I, it, it didn't hit me. I, I didn't quite, it's like, okay, uh, can you strip it in Spanish, right? Because, um, you know, when I heard the moments later when he repeated in Spanish and I heard it in Spanish, yes, then I felt it, right? I had been looking forward to hear those words and then I felt it really intensely. But in English, I didn't quite feel them, right? So this is um, some new research now is talking about the relationship between cognition and emotion. And this is really interesting because historically in psychology, you have had uh, you know, the cognitive people over there studying language, attention, memory, all those cognitive stuff. And then you have had the emotion people over here studying uh, stress, depression, anxiety. But things are changing. Uh, in the last decade of the decade of, or so, there have been a lot of more integration of these topics. So, for example, an example of this is when I arrived at AKU, my graduate class that I teach to our graduate students was called Cognitive Basis of Behavior. And then we changed the name and the content of that class to now call it cognitive and affective basis of behavior. And part of the idea is that cognition and affection, or in this case, emotion, are really connected. So this kind of launched me in a path on how, in my specific area of research, language and emotion are connected, right? So let me share screen one more time and show you this study. So this study has been published in the journal Cognition and Emotion, which is actually a big deal journal. It's a really cool journal. And it has become really popular because of this uh, uh, situation that I'm talking to you about, that in the last decade or so, there has been an explosion of research on in that cognitive psychologists and, and people who study emotion have come together to, to really understand how memory and emotion are connected, how language and emotion are connected, how decision making and emotion are connected. Um, so we, um, you know, we, we published this study and full disclosure, this study, we use taboo words, right? So in this study, uh, we, we use taboo words and we compare first and second language speakers of English. So our first language speakers of English, these are uh, speakers for whom English is the first language they've spoken English since they were kids. And then our second language speakers are those who learn English later in life. So usually eight or nine years old, or, you know, I will be a second language because, you know, I, I felt like I learned English at like 21, right? So the question is, are is emotion more intense for the first language, uh, the first um, those who, who learn English first, and less intense for those who learn English second, right? Okay, so the task uh, here is still uh, a mouse tracking task. I told you that's kind of my thing that I do. <laughs> but here we use what is called a lexical decision task. So a lexical decision task is where you ask people uh, to tell you whether they are hearing over headphones. And this can be also written, but in this study it was over headphones. You put a word over headphones and you ask people, okay, is this a word? or not, right? So if they hear a word, they have to click on word. And they, if they hear just sounds like kish, kish, pish, or something that is not an English word, they have to click on non-word, right? So they click start, they hear the word bagel, and they're like, okay, that's a word. Now, in this study, in addition to neutral words like bagel, we also had taboo words, right? And these taboo words, um, you know, uh, I'm going to have one. I, I chose the taboo word that was like the least uh, taboo, but if anyone is sensitive, please do not read what is inside the, the little, uh, you know, bubble for the next uh, slide, uh, um, for the next step. But when people hear taboo words, we know in, in cognitive psychology that they respond faster, more efficiently, right? This is a, a known thing in the literature. So, when people hear taboo words, they go straight to words. Like they, they recognize those taboo words more, more efficiently. So now the real question, we know in this case, we know that in general, the taboo line, in this case, the, the purple line is gonna be above the neutral line because there is this taboo effect that uh, has been shown that, that people recognize taboo words more efficiently. So when you hear a taboo word, it catches your attention, you remember it better, you process it faster. The question that I was interested in, coming back to that, I love you didn't quite feel as well as the kiddo, is 
is this taboo effect? Is, the, is this difference between the taboo and the neutral words? Is this emotionality affecting second language speakers less? So in other words, is the difference between the taboo and the neutral lines bigger for the first language speakers for that square on the left than for the second language speakers? So is our taboo and neutral word, um, are taboo words less intense for those second language speakers? So the answer was yes. Uh, as you can see there on the left side for the first language speakers, uh, the, the taboo words shoot up really quickly. Those taboo words in your first language really affect you. They are quick and easy and you process them fast. Now for the second language speakers, these are people who learn English later on in their life. There is still a taboo effect. They still um, did better with taboo words than neutral words, but it was not as big. Like the emotionality of those taboo words didn't affect them uh, as much. Okay. Okay. Um, so there is a couple other uh, articles that I uh, kind of studies and, and findings that I want to mention about emotion and language that um, I think are really cool. So one of those is about a skin conductivity. Uh, so th this is Harris et al. She's a pioneer on these type of studies. And she found that when you put um, a skin conductivity measure. So when you basically uh, uh, put like an ele like a electrode on people's hand to measure whether they are sweating or not, this is uh, one of the studies that, that kind of catches the motion and activation of the physiological system. They found that um, when you, people hear reprimands, so they didn't use the words, they used reprimands. So reprimands are things like eat your vegetables or you are grounded or, you know, like things that a parent will say or, or things like that, uh, or I'm disappointed that you, or, you know, those type of things that generate emotions or put you in a situation. So they did this with first language speakers and second language speakers, and they uh, they measure that in their first language, sorry, it's, it was actually bilinguals. It was the same bilinguals in the first and second language, and they found now, the same people, when they heard those reprimands in their first language, they were more active, it affected them more, they, they were more like, you know, uh, kind of like affected by it, versus when they heard those reprimands in their second language, they were a lot cooler about it, they, they were not as affected, right? So that's one that I thought it was interesting. And another study related to this emotion and cognition, and this one is specifically about decision-making that I thought was fascinating, re, uh, refers to the trolley problem. So those of you who are not familiar, uh, the trolley problem is like this big dilemma in philosophy, right? And the trolley problem shows that uh, the, the situation is there's a train coming, right? And if you pull the lever, you can um, save five people that are in the current path of the train. But when you pull the lever, you actually kill one person that is on the other side, right? So the options are you do nothing and you let five people die, or you move the lever and you save five people, but you kill one. And that word kill, that has emotional context, right? Like when you, when you hear, am I a killer? Am I gonna kill this one person? Well, when, what research has found is when people were answering in their first language, which is more emotional, they were more likely to choose the let the people die, less utilitarian approaches, versus when people were answering their second language, which is a little bit less emotional, more detached, they were more likely to pull the lever and do the utilitarian approach, save the many, right? Like kill the one to save the many, because in that case, they may have been able to wait, okay, is one person dead versus five people dead? And the word kill may have not affected them as much, right? Because they were somewhat more detached. So these are some examples of how uh, language and emotion can have real world implications, right? Another um, topic that, that relates to this is with therapy, there has been some examples in which bilinguals, uh, if a trauma happened in a particular language and that person is not like able to talk about it, by approaching and trying to talk about it in their other language that is a little bit more detached and less emotionally intense, sometimes that has helped people being able to talk and process the trauma that happened in one language because they were able to talk about it in the other language that was more detached. Come. So that is what I had about language and emotion, all sorts of cool articles and studies coming up about that. So when we put it all together, I hope I've convinced you that language does influence you. 
language changes how you respond. And we saw this because bilinguals who use their languages a lot respond more efficiently than bilinguals who use their languages less or monolinguals. Language changes how you think. Those Spaniards were thinking that tuba was actually more of a neutral instrument where the English speakers were, no, no, tuba is super masculine, right? And then language changes how you feel. So we saw that those taboo words were not doing it for the second language speakers. Like it wasn't affecting them as much and it was affecting those first language speakers, right? So that is all I had. If you enjoy um, my little stories and anecdotes, I have a blog, Blogueando en Español. While well, the blog is in Spanish, if you right click and, and use Google Translate, you can read it in English if you don't know Spanish. And, um, you know, this blog, I share a lot of uh, anecdotes. My husband absolutely loved that I share all the embarrassing personal details of our life in this blog. But, you know, I tell him it's for science. Um, if you're a student looking for a mentor and, and you're interested in the psychology of language, by all means, email me. The Multilingual Laboratory, we are in the kids building and we are doing all sorts of cool research about language, emotion, cognition, and all of the above. So with that, I look forward to hearing your questions and answer any questions that you may have. Hello again, Sarah, thank you so very much. I'm just uh, switching up here to gallery view. <clears throat> I don't know if that's gonna make a difference for the YouTube feed or not, um, <clears throat> but it looks better on my screen. So in any case, thank you again very much for that really wonderful uh, and ranging tour of different ways of using data and uh, particular types of right mouse tracking and clicking data um, to gather uh, fascinating information about uh, language and its effects. Um, and I know people uh, will have some questions or I should say more questions um, in a moment, but I suppose, well, there's one question that came in early. So I'll throw that out there to you because I think it probably applies to um, all of the studies that you uh, focused on, okay? And it has to do with sample size. Um, oh, I love Crocker, stats questions. <laughs> yeah, Kelly, Kelly Crocker just asked about the sample size. And I think that was regarding the first study um, about the Stroop effect, but I guess in, in general, we could ask that about all of your studies. Can you talk about that? Yes, so my that was my doctoral dissertation. So I had upwards of 100 participants on, on that one. And that was because my goal was to have 20 participants per decade, right? And half my lingual and half monolingual. So that was a big sample size. Um, normally, most of these studies, these are experimental. We try to control really well. So our, uh, our goal is to have maybe like 30 people per group, per cell, right? And then in terms of um, newest research have shown that it's more, it's better having 40. So now, we are having 40 participants, but also new research is coming up on trials. You want to have 40 words and 40 participants, because historically there has been some studies that there, they may have had enough participants, like 30 or 40 participants, but they had only like five or 10 words. Now, um, there is some analysis, sample size analysis that have shown that you want to have both. You want to have uh, 40 people answering, and each of those 40 people should be answering to 40 different trials. So 40 words if it's a lexical decision or 40, uh, you know, uh, if it's like the the instrument for the instruments. And of course, some of those things are hard sometimes. Like we couldn't find that many instruments with Spanish grammar that were uh, masculine for this, the English. Mm -hmm. Well, so some of these have limitations of the real, can you find that many words on that condition? But the, the gold standard will be 40 participants per cell. So if you have two groups, 80 participants, and then 40 uh, words uh, per condition. Okay, so yeah, very sophisticated and diversified. And, and that results in, um, I'm not a statistician, but that results in pretty high degrees of confidence, right? And, That's and, the goal. Yeah. We try. We not only get there, not all my sample size are that nice. I have some publication with like 20 or 32, maybe. Right. So there, now, there's a reality, but yeah, we try. <laughs> now, let me just ask kind of a quick follow-up on that. You know, on each of your graphs, the distinction between the different lines, I mean, it was visible and there, but, you know, what would you say about the degree of significance in each of those cases? Because there's a way that, you know, an unsophisticated viewer of data, of graphs like myself could say, well, it doesn't look that dramatic. So can you say some more? Yes. 
So without getting too fancy here, the, the, the methodology is called growth curve analysis. Okay. And basically what it does is it treats time as a continuum and it plots the trajectory. So it kind of measures the overall, either the slope, like how, like are, is, is more like a flat slope or is more like a steep slope. And then it does the statistical analysis on the slope uh, of the slope of the trajectory. So you know, uh, it's called growth curve analysis. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get super detailed on it, but I'm a big fan. I have books on it and I'm happy to share with anyone interested. Great. Books um, that I've read, not that I've written. That's not my topic, but <laughs> I can, I use. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. There are some questions and lots of comments coming in and we'll get back to those in a minute, but you started us off with um, an invitation to share uh, background and experiences, uh, how did you put it, uh, studying and or living abroad or being immersed in a foreign language environment. And we had several responses um, from Kelly who says yes uh, in Mexico and Colombia. Um, and uh, another, Jasmine studied abroad in Spain for two weeks with a smiley face. Yay. Um, I don't know if she studied <laughs> Spanish language or not while there. Um, Saskia is originally from Germany, and so she came to EKU to study and has found it an interesting experience to come here and be in an environment, you know, dealing in English all day long. Um, Saskia, if you're still there, you might share whether you or how much English you already knew before you came here um, and whether that influenced your, uh, I guess, integration or whatever immersion here at EKU. Um, let's see, a couple more. Uh, Juicy Jazzy Jeff says he was born in the U.S., so naturally his mother tongue is English, uh, but his family moved to South Korea, and so he was raised and had to learn to speak Korean. And Michaela studied abroad in the Netherlands and lived in a bilingual household. Um, Dallas. We have a very diverse uh, audience. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots of stuff. And I chimed in there that, uh, you know, I was born in the U.S. and moved to Canada in high school where uh, French was required. And my first day in high school was actually sitting in a French class. I was just telling my wife this the other day uh, when uh, the professor or the teacher came around the room and asked everybody questions in French and I had no idea what was going on. And so when he got to me, I said, sir, I have no idea what you're saying. And everybody in the class you know, uh, noticed that I was the new kid. Um, so, I mean, this is still a good position to be in because you at least could say that my English, my Ireland professors did not know Spanish. So if I will have say, right. mm, this, I, no one will, <laughs> I guess someone, they will have guessed that I was not understanding, but you know, that's actually at least a nice, if they are bilingual, at least you have an E in there. <laughs> yeah. And then a lot of people just to press on in response to your questions, a lot of people have learned uh, other languages. Um, Dallas has learned German and is taking Chinese. Michael jokes, I'm still trying to learn English. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Nick uh, studied abroad in Mexico, learning Spanish. And oh, about your question uh, regarding uh, language headaches and exhaustion, he says he had to take a nap, a language nap, because of the exhaustion of 10 plus hours of translating in his own head every day. Yeah, and that's also, when you said translated, remind me. So translators, you know how they switch a lot, right? Uh, we've, you've probably seen it with maybe sign language that they, you know, there's like a different person that comes in and out or also with yes. uh, simultaneous translation is absolutely exhausting. Like the taxing, the tax, how much it taxes your brain is like absolutely exhausting. And, you know, I totally get the language snap, but I took those two. <laughs> yeah, well, there are lots of other uh corroborating testimonies of that. Um, let's see, uh, Kelly says, yeah, I learned Spanish and Portuguese and yes, speaking Spanish all day used to be exhausting, but not so much now. Like you said, you know, you, you kind of keep learning and, and it gets easier. Uh, yeah, that's the beauty of your brain. Eventually you automate a lot of things, right? Like our brain, when it's conscious and a fourfold, you have to, you get the headache. But the moment you start automating some of this process, it becomes more automatic. And then, then you can make mistakes, but it's less a fourfold. <laughs> and I, you know, you studied uh, language acquisition across the lifespan. Is that the case that the brain is fairly plastic and, and you know, can accomplish that fairly well into older age? 
Yes, yeah, so actually there's some interesting research uh, coming up now in which um, in our study, the effect of bilingualism was consistent across the lifespan. Uh, we had a, we were wondering whether it would be larger either with younger people or older people or depending of, and it was not, the, it was just consistent. In general, bilinguals perform better regardless and it changed how much they use their language. So those who use their languages more, they perform better, but it was across all ages. And now there is some studies coming up um, you know, like in Edinburgh, there is uh, like the University of Edinburgh, they have some, and there's also some others that are, are, are basically doing uh, uh, training for like language training in older adults, like retirees who have some time and they teach them a language. So, you know, they measure them before, they measure them after, and they see, and they are seeing some interesting improvements in that at any age, if you um, use this language, you can get these benefits, right? And uh, it's kind of interesting. This This actually, um, you know, relates to also other ways of learning, like Duolingo and other programs, and they have used some of those with retirees, and, and they have shown improvements. Great, thank you. Well, I, I see people are chiming in with lots of questions now, so we should get down to uh, the list of those in a moment, but um, people have given various answers to your tuba question. Um, <laughs> not, not surprisingly, based on what you shared, you know, most people who say English is their first language say the tuba is masculine um, because of its deep sound and maybe it's heft and, and all the rest of it. But uh, Saskia, whose language is, first language is German, says feminine. Um, yes, I agree with Saskia. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see, uh, we have a musician in the audience who chimed into this as well, Dominique. Uh, she's in the EKU music department, and she says in French, tuba is masculine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and she also adds an interesting kind of uh, experiential note that since she is a professional musician who plays in an orchestra, she thinks the genre of instruments affects, doesn't affect her as much as the associations she has with people's, people who play them. So maybe the violin, I don't know, in, in one circumstance could be masculine because the concert master is, you know, a, a male violinist or what have you. Um, that is fascinating. Yeah. We have another study. This was uh, an honors thesis that actually got published in the uh, journal, The Psychology of Music. And this study was only about the sound. So this was the pitch. This was, I know very little. I was just involved because I had done the original study. It was like a spin-off. But this, uh, this undergrad was amazing. And she did all this work with music. And it was all perfectly controlled. And, and basically what she found is when um, the same instrument was... Uh, people listen to the to like different uh, melodies of all these instruments and when the when the melody was like higher pitch people rated it more feminine when the instrument the same instrument and when it was lower pitch so they still overall rated the instruments according to these general ideas right like the flute was still feminine and the um you know like the tuba was still masculine uh, but the pitch in which the melody was played changed significantly how much feminine or masculine so for sure uh, the the musician there is some research showing that as well but also the pitch and the type the size of the instrument and the characteristics so it was really interesting how much in my in my understanding of this literature is our brain just puts it all together and then your final kind of choice is kind of like an aggregator of all these pieces of information that you have put together. Yes, yes. Okay, I get it. Thank you. Um, all right. Now down to the question uh, portion of our audience's uh, comments. Well, with a lot of compliments. Thank you. Great Thank you. presentation. Pre you know, presentation, excuse me, nicely done, fascinating stuff, all that. You can read all those later. Um, yes. Tammy asks, Tammy wants to know, and I guess this is kind of analogous to your questions, can language change how you respond and think and feel? Um, and, you know, looking at the various things that uh, relate to those. Um, oh, now I've lost it. Uh, does dialect have the same effect on response? Fascinating question. So that is great. There is very, very, very little. So one of my goals is to recruit, uh, you know, a bright undergrad to do Appalachian studies and compare Appalachian <laughs> uh, and, you know, like uh, standard or, or the people who switch between, you know, like I have so many st students that you suddenly, uh, you know, see them in the corridor and they pick up the phone and then they completely switch how they are talking and they get into like Appalachian dialect. Um, we 
I don't think we have much data on that. There is some studies more broadly talking about what is a language and what is a dialect? And this is apparently like a big debate and I haven't mm -hmm. wanna get into the debate. What I have not seen though, is this type of studies in which you get these different people who switch it between these dialects um, and then relate that to attention, to attentional tasks like this. Yes some or other, other tasks like that. I have not seen that. If, if anyone has, please send it to me. And I would love to do that with Appalachian dialectical people who, who switch between like these different dialects. Um, but as, a far, as far as I know, I have not seen that research just yet. So it's ripe for me to do it. <laughs> That's a great suggestion. So students out there listening, uh, yeah, per, you know, follow up on that. And that reminds me that, you know, I spent a year in uh, South Georgia teaching French and Latin, uh, as well as a couple classes in English, but with students from, you know, the deep southern part of the state of Georgia. And even though I grew up in Virginia, so I had, you know, some sense of Southern American English, it was difficult for me, right, in terms of uh, mental uh, effort and attention and so on, uh, to, to code switch as, yes. as well as teach in those multiple languages. And so I found myself coming home at the end of the day, extremely exhausted, barely able to have a conversation with my wife at the dinner table sometimes. Uh, so well, all that effort is probably translated in grain cognitive health, less decline later in life. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That explains it. <laughs> um, I hope to remain sharp. So, um, all right, we have lots of questions here. I just have to scroll through. Um, let's see. Well, Jazzy Jeff says, as a bilingual, it was very interesting to hear your presentation. Okay, Shelby um, says and asks, you mentioned a comparison between bilingual and dyslexic people. Do you believe, or is there evidence to suggest the way dyslexic and bilingual people interpret or take in language is similar? Very good question. So I love this question because now I can talk about my wonderful collaborators in Spain that I'm working on. So we got a grant um, and we're in the middle of the grant. It's a three-year grant. So my collaborators in Spain and I, uh, we're uh, looking at bilingual children and how bilingual children. Um, uh, so uh, in Spain, we collect the Spaniards learning English. And here in Lexington, we in the Maxwell School, we collect data from English children learning Spanish. And um, we haven't got into this dyslexia part, but we've done some of the background research. And so far, uh, everything that we've seen is that the percentage of students who are dyslexic are the same in the general population and in the bilingual population. So dyslexia seems to be sort of a, a general um, you know, like uh, like you you have it or you don't. But if, if you are gonna have it, that percentage of, of students who have it uh, is the same percentage in the general population and in the bilingual population. Now, some of the interesting things that we've started to dive in, and we haven't collected data from dyslexic bilinguals yet, but some of the interesting things is that in different languages, children are dys dyslexic in different ways. Uh, so for example, more transparent languages. So Spanish is a very transparent language. And what that means is every sound has a letter. And if you have a letter, there is a sound and there is no mismatches, right? Versus uh, English is as opaque as it gets because you have like E, e can be A and E can be I and can be E, like, you know, the same, the two letters can be 50 different sounds. So for some of these dyslexic uh, children in which their problem is that they have trouble decoding each sound, um, for those kids, if they learn Spanish first and they have a, an easier uh, letter to sound, so grapheme to phoneme uh, matching, some of that can help them then transfer some of those skills into English. So there is some interesting, while the percentage of dyslexic children are equal in the, in the general population that in the bilingual population, the ability to cope with the dyslexia may be facilitated if one of your languages is a more transparent, easier to read in language. Right, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a question here from Dr. O, uh, <laughs> Richard. Hi, Richard. <laughs> um, he, he says, uh, some languages are romantic, like French, and some languages are hard, like Russian. To an English-only speaker, would I love you in French sound nicer than I love you in Russian? 
<laughs> I love the question. So I think this is where the listener comes in, right? Because when the moment you said sound nicer, this brings me back totally to all my research in accents. So when you hear accents, everyone has an accent, right? Whether an accent is native or pleasant, or if you like it, or if you don't, it's totally on you. It's not, it's not intrinsic to the accent, right? So I know there is people who have fascination for French and there's people who have fascination, you know, but if your first love was someone in Russia, maybe that word, those words in Russia are particularly meaningful to you. So I love the question, but I don't, I don't think it's so much about the sound itself as how your own associations with the sound. And we have some of these with foreign accents. So when people uh, have negative associations with a particular accent or negative experience with a particular accent, they kind of rate those speakers with that accent more negatively and people who have positive experience, right? And then there's also more like microeconomic levels here. So some languages in the world order are considered more prestigious, right? Like, so maybe if you think like, I, I don't know what example to give, but like Oxford English, for example, right? As opposed right more of another dialect um, and, and people associate positive or negative emotions with those uh, accents. So uh, if, if for you an accent means good things and for someone else an accent means bad things, it's, it's really about the listener. So a lot of my work is on what characteristics of the listener, right? Like the accent is the accent, but how are the listeners understanding this accent, interpreting these accents and processing them in a way that they either perceive them in a positive or negative way? And then you add emotion to that. And now you have 10 years of research for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'll just chime in to say that as somebody who um, makes a kind of sideline study of opera uh, in which there's a lot of love music, uh, you can find, you know, uh, very pleasant sounding, wonderful love songs in almost every operatic language. <laughs> uh, and I'm actually saying that for Richard's benefit because I'm trying to get him to, you know, get more involved in classical music. But uh, in any case, <laughs> um, I digress. Uh, a couple people, um, Sarah, wanted to point out that um, uh, a kind of connection, a Spanish connection with you. Uh, Joan Tapias Hosta, I hope I pronounced that right, says, hey, Sarah, I'm also from Spain, Barcelona oh, cool. in this case, Very and cool. is at EKU studying. Um, and uh, hasn't struggled too much speaking English all the time. Um, and uh, Jasmine says that she, in fact, visited the University of uh, Salamanca, and it was so oh, beautiful. Cool. And she's delighted to know we have a professor, uh, 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 professora from there. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> so there's lots of stuff like that. Um, I will but, make sure to read them all. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh, Anne has a question. Uh, do you think people have different personalities when they are speaking their first versus their second language? That is awesome. That is actually, there is a lot of research on this and they have found differences on this. But what was really interesting is that it's not necessarily the person that changes, it's how you express it, right? So I have a personal anecdote for this as well. For me, uh, when I go to Spain, uh, I, I personally feel a lot funnier in Spanish, for example, right? Like in English, double entendres and, and jokes and all of these things, uh, you know, always fall a little bit more coarse or less natural than in Spanish for me. Um, so what I, what I uh, some of the research that I've seen is that it's not necessarily people, their personalities are different, but it's how they express them that are different, right? So um, it, like there is some research that if you answer the same questionnaire in one language than the other, you, you get to different, so it kind of activates those ways of thinking for you, right? So this relates to, you know, like when there's some other research uh, in psychology that, that says like, if you mention your gender before and you associate negative stereotypes, uh, for example, if you're a female and you associate negative stereotypes and then you, you do a female, uh, you, sorry, you do a math test that has traditionally females perform worse, then you may perform worse than if, if you are asked about some other question at the, at the beginning. So some of the studies in bilinguals have shown some of those things that if you imagine uh, Spaniards are associated with more extroversion uh, versus maybe English speakers. So maybe if I answer, I haven't actually done this, but if I answer some of these personality tests in, in thinking in Spanish, and I'm thinking about the things that I do in Spain that may be different. So it, it is maybe not so much about you changing your personality, 
it's more like as along the continuum of where your personality traits are, you may be a little higher or lower in wherever that language brings out from you, if that makes sense. But some of these will, this is also another fascinating study. Everything you're saying, I'm like, I want to do a study about that. <laughs> yeah, these are all great questions. And there's lots more comments than I can uh, read here about people continuing to share their experiences abroad and coming here and just language, um, you know, uh, navigating, right, uh, language back and forth. You know, I, I spent a little time in Italy um, and on two study abroad stints, and I'll say that I, I don't know if I really am, but I certainly feel a little bit more cool and sophisticated <laughs> when I'm speaking Italian. <laughs> It's uh, totally about the environment as well, right? Like that's true. There's a social vacation, yeah. right? If one of your languages is the vacation language and you only speak that when you are away from work, like if you work in Italian, maybe it wouldn't feel like be very different. Yeah. It's just the associations that when you use that language, you are in that context. And that happens a lot uh, with people who use at home a language that is different than at work, right? Like or for different areas. For me, when I first moved to the States, it was so hard, like I had zero vocabulary for kids stuff right like how is um i don't even know it right now like uh the, the swings and kids uh, those are very basic words and i had no idea any of those words because i have not had mm, play right. with kids in place Always right in so, yeah. yeah so there is so much that is like however you use that it's going to affect how you think about it and how you uh what comes to mind when you are speaking in that language cool um, we have uh, at least one more question here, which uh, I'm not exactly sure when it came in. And you might have touched upon this, uh, but maybe you could just clarify a bit. Saskia asks, does age or the time that someone learns a language affect the statistics? I, I'm assuming the statistics of, you know, how, uh, you know, people respond and think and feel in those various tests that you've done. Very good question. So for, for sure, age of acquisition, so the age at which you start learning a language. So if you start younger or if you start older, that makes a big difference. So for example, with accents in particular, very few people, there's some studies showing that very few people who learn after 16 years old speak without a foreign accent. Like you usually need to be less than 16 years old in a language to, to sound native. That's sort of the accent. Now for the motion, uh, we were just starting this because uh, when you think about a lot of my samples were college students, right? So for them, having uh, started at, at zero uh, years old or whatever, like from they were born, uh, starting at eight, and if they are 20, that's like almost half their life, right? So in, in they, those cases, make a difference. Now, what happened with people like me? who I've spent now 10 years in the United States. And a lot of those years have been, my personal life has been in English as well. Have I now switched the other way, in which now English has more, it has more emotion? We don't have those type of studies in which what happens. So if you spend less time in a language or in contexts that are maybe more professional contexts, as opposed to personal context, for sure, you're gonna have more or less emotion. But we don't know what happens if then later on in life you spend more time in the emotional context in the other language. Does it switch or not? Or we, we don't have much data on, on the evolution of how language over time um, affects you. And I, thank you. I mean, that's fascinating stuff to think about how fluid, you know, uh, that relationship might be depending upon your current situation uh, your level of immersion and what have you, um, and and or how integrated your personal and work, personal versus work lives might be. And on that score, Dominique, our uh, music colleague, says that she works in English, teaches at EKU, but at home things are in French. <laughs> so shopping lists and books that she reads for pleasure, etc. Right. So she's maintaining. I guess that's a work life balance <laughs> in English, <laughs> English and French. Um, Okay, we'll give people just one more minute to get a final question and if there is something on people's minds. And meanwhile, uh, I'll ask my question, um, which uh, is something Sarah and I have chatted about uh, off screen as it were uh, before, uh, about Duolingo. And you mentioned this in passing in your, your presentation. You know, I've been trying to improve my Italian skills by using Duolingo for a couple of years now, actually. And I think I recall you telling me that Duolingo is quite actively involved in and being used for research and 
you know, aspects of analyzing language acquisition, but I really don't have any sense of exactly how they're doing that. Can, you know, what can you share about that? And, you know, what might be learned from that, uh, that, I guess, you know, keyboard or cell phone approach, right? Yeah, so this was actually interesting, a study. I don't think this has been published yet. I was a reviewer, you know, when journals are, um, you know, vetting articles. Uh, I, I was asked to review the study, which I found fascinating. This was with retirees. It's kind of what I was mentioning before. And they had these retirees in like three groups, the waiting list, which are the no intervention group. Um, oh, actually, it was like, just like, a come and sit and chat in this room or something like that. And right. then like a like an actual group um, doing just general cognitive training, right? Like some of those general cognitive task type of group. And then they have the Duolingo group. And it was actually Duolingo that was like, they, they were using that app. So they bought tablets for all these uh, retirees and then they, ta they taught them how to use it. And they, they had to use at least like 30 minutes every day for like, I don't remember exactly, but maybe like four weeks, like it was like an intervention. And then at the end of the intervention, they actually saw that uh, that Duolingo had in, enhanced their attentional skills, right? Like kind of like the task I were talking about. It wasn't just the language. This was these were also the nonverbal tasks, like tasks with arrows and other things that we cognitive psychologists use. So it was really interesting to see how it wasn't such a crazy intervention. It was just like four weeks, and it was like um, you know um, just thirty minutes a day, and and they saw these differences. And what was really interesting is the Duolingo group didn't got necessarily faster, right? Like the, the brain, active brain task group got like really quick. The Duolingo group didn't got necessarily that much faster, but they got more efficient. Like they were able to focus on one thing, ignore the other thing, kind of like, you know, some of the things we've talked about. So it definitely is interesting. And also... Um, when, when the part that I also enjoy was the ratings, uh, they had like a, a subjective perception and everyone loved the Duolingo uh, app much more than the other. So just let me clarify, I'm not paid Duolingo. I don't have any- Yeah, this is not a pitch for Duolingo. Um, no, but I- Lots of what language I've read, apps are really good. Yeah, and now personally, if you ask me what is the first, the best way to learn a language, right? I will say, go and be immersed in it. For me, mm -hmm. follow love with a person who only spoke English work out really well for my <laughs> right so if you can go and get immersed in the language and study abroad that's my pitch I, I would say go be immersed and only talk to people who don't know and at first no one will understand you but eventually you will get better at that language that's like my top uh, suggestion but if you cannot uh, go and talk to people who don't know your language then I think Duolingo is a close second there that's great to know thank you uh, you know do you know if Duolingo, like as a system, um, I don't want to say surveils people, but does it have the ability to, to basically track, you know, um, and in, uh, how people are learning and learn themselves from that? Like, is there, I, I know there's got to be machine learning going on and it's kind of crowdsourced. And because, you know, when I, uh, if I don't think, a translation is correct, I can contribute that to Duolingo and then I guess they take it into advisement and they might update things. But you know, what other kinds of uses, if you know, you know, is it being put to? My understanding is that Duolingo, what they are doing is they are helping translate the internet. So my understanding is they put these words or sentences to different people. And when 10 people agree on a translation, then they give that as a pass and then that happen that that works. So they've translated like Wikipedia, like these big pages, they have um, crowdsourced the translation of the internet. And the more people join uh, the app, especially more people with diverse languages, the more they are able to translate more languages and to translate bigger pieces, right? So they yeah. always start with something, they already have the right answer, and then they, they get into more stuff in which they may not yet have the right answer. And when 10 people agree on an answer, they consider it, or 10 or whatever their algorithm is, but they consider it. So it's kind of like a crowdsourcing way to translate the internet, which I found really interesting because then the participants are not necessarily the product, like in other uh, you know platforms. The participants are workers, but you are working while you are getting le to learn. While well, you're learning, and and you're happy to work. You're doing the work, yeah. and then they can translate uh, things and and get right, like translating all those pages. If you hire translators, will be a ton of pay expenses. So it kind yes. of 
be balanced. So that's what I saw, but you know, I, I'm not sure about the details, but I thought I thought it was a really good model in which people working, helping translating, and then everyone benefits. Indeed, yeah, symbiotic relationship. Uh, would that all life could be like that. Well, thank you very much for being here, Sarah. You know, uh, we appreciate you sharing your work and your expertise uh, on uh, data and uh, the bilingual mind. And we wish you the best of luck in your continuing research. And, you know, maybe a, in a, whatever, a couple of years, we'll get an update from you on that. Uh, <laughs> that'd be good to have. Thank you. Maybe I should talk with special event, quick update on where things have developed. Um, and let's see, uh, again, in the meantime, um, I want to wish everybody out there uh, um, a good evening. Uh, good luck uh, with everything you're doing. People are saying thank you again, Sarah. And, yeah, thank um, you. I want to say thank you too to all those people I've been bothering for years about language questions and all of you <laughs> supporting me and helping me. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and everybody continue to stay safe, uh, get your vaccinations, and uh, let's all continue to get life back to uh, a greater semblance of normal. Um, I want to, before we close, uh, just remind people uh, that our last Chautauqua of this spring will be three weeks from tonight on April 8th when philosopher Jennifer Fry from the University of South Carolina will be here to talk about classical approaches, actually classical and contemporary approaches to the meaning of life. Uh, this is a, uh, an event that we had initially planned to schedule last year and we're delighted that uh, Jennifer Fry was able to make time to join us this year in spite of you know how things turned out last uh, spring. Um, Richard wants to know, okay, this will be the final word. Uh, how do we say great presentation in Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> Una presentación, I don't know, eh, genial, estupenda, estupenda. I'm gonna go estupenda. with Estupenda, okay. Una presentación estupenda. Muchas gracias, uh, amiga y colega. And good night to everybody out there. Uh, thank you again Buenas for joining noches. us here at EKU Chautauqua. Bye bye for Muchas now. Gracias. Thank you. <laughs>